I uh, call this meeting of the Enterprise Committee into session. Uh, we're going to hear today from uh, from the port and AWW, and we'll see if we have time. Maybe we'll hear from others too. But uh, um, introduce the folks up here. Jennifer Johnson. LD Gray Jones. Tim Steele. And, uh, I guess, uh, Steve, you're up first. Just stand, is that right? Or, uh, That's fine and dandy. Okay. Speak up so we can get you on tape. All right. Uh, Steve Rebuffo, Port Director. And uh, I'm here this morning with Ron Ellich, who is our, uh, the lead for THQM, our project management consultant team uh, that also resides on the port for the Anchorage Port Modernization Project. Uh, when we spoke on the phone, sir, you, you asked for a, a couple, an update on how things were going with Alaska Basic Industry and Delta Westerns. Uh, their, with their construction projects down at the port, and then I'll, I'll let Juan bring you up to speed on where we are uh, on the uh, on the project itself. So let's talk about ABI first. They're the easy one. Uh, you know, as everybody knows by now, the ABI is constructing this white dome-shaped storage facility. It's designed to hold 40,000 tons of cement. Uh, with the 20,000 tons of storage they already have down there, they have in essence tripled the amount of uh, cement that they can keep in store down at the port. The business motivation behind doing that was to get a little bit off of being caught at the margin at the end of a construction season by not having enough to start the next construction season before the first ship comes in. So it allows them to bring in additional uh, additional supply to uh, to meet the demand and to meet what they're, what they're forecasting to be a, a little bit of a growing demand for construction uh, here in the state. Uh, where they are now is they finished about a month ago with the, uh, with the, with the steel reinforced shock creating that was done on the outside of that dome. The dome went up as a uh, kind of like a, a balloon, if you will, in the beginning with a big air compressor outside blowing air inside it and raising it up and, and getting it shaped. Once it was all shaped up, then they went inside with the shock creating like you're building a swimming pool and sprayed around the interior put steel reinforcement in it uh, to create the hard structure. And then that skin stays on the outside as the exterior structure. It's white, so it reflects the heat and moisture doesn't build up inside. You don't get condensation because you want cement, you want concrete and you want concrete. You don't want it any other time. So that's kind of the, the, the motivation behind here. Since they finished that, they put on top of it what they call a high hat. It's a, it's, it's a structure of machinery, uh, and all the plumbing that comes off of the that comes off of their dock will run up the outside and into the dome from the top. So all the cement will be loaded from the top. They started pouring the floor about two weeks ago, and uh, and it's just about done. And Dale Mormon tells me that by late October, early November, uh, they'll have the floor done in there, and the, and the uh, dome will be ready to receive product. They have one more ship coming in in early November uh, for the season. And uh, he's also extended an invitation to anybody who may be interested in coming out and seeing it once it's done to, to come on down. So uh, I'll go ahead and I'll put the word out for anybody on this committee who might be interested in, uh, in taking a, a quick tour uh, inside this thing once it's done. I'd like Nothing to say. Nothing else, it would be a yeah, lot of fun. I mean, it's fascinating. Is, so do they have, is, is the HVAC system? I mean, how they've got to have some kind well, of. Well, yeah, they, it, it's ventilated, and there and there is a way to keep the dust down inside. I don't ask me what that is, though. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, but that's all part of the of, of all the that's mechanical the that's going in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I can, I, I'm going I'm going to find out that what I see in my mind's eye is probably not what's really there. So I'm looking forward to doing yeah. it as well. Uh, Delta Western. Uh, so uh, it led LB. I'm sorry. LB. That's okay. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Um, I probably missed it, but this dome is for storage for construction. Storage of cement. cement. Right, storage of cement. I know yes. that part. For, but for state for construction projects, uh, they ship quite a bit of it uh, up to the mines. Okay, so it's storage for cement for projects throughout the community? Or throughout the state. Throughout the state. Their customer base is all over the place. Okay, all so the that's and, the barrel, and, the, and it's down, down at the home. port? I'm sorry? And it's down at the port? It's at the port, yeah. Hmm. So I have another You're question the only if I can follow up. Who hasn't seen it. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> but anyway, um, my follow up question is so, and I, and you know, I don't come to these meetings often, but I'm very happy I'm here today. 
Um, so why is it being, why storage for uh, concrete for the state? Not concrete. Cement. cement. All right, I made a mistake, sorry. Yeah. For cement for the state, why is it being stored at the port other than maybe that's where the space is? So why is well, it happening there? There's, there's a rail connection at the port. Right. Yeah. It is the only receiving point for that company. Okay. And, uh, and what they do, and what, what's been happening of late is they have to, they have to pre-stage everything to, to move them into, because they don't have enough storage at the port and move it down to where their facilities are at uh, the end of Minnesota and uh, an old sewer okay. where Anchorage Sand and Gravel is. So they're handling it twice. Mm -hmm. They can leave it at the port. They don't have to handle it twice. They can load it on whatever delivery vehicle is going to take it to its final destination. So <clears throat> when you do that, you take some of the transportation piece out and your costs go down. Okay, thank you. And not, not to take up a lot of time, Mr. Chairman, but I'm being educated here and I really appreciate it. So the dome is on port, um, property. on port property. So is port getting any we're getting compensation? Lease revenue as well. Okay, yeah, excellent. Lease revenue and, in fact, we're getting lease revenue now because they couldn't start the construction until they have a lease. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, we get that and, and dockage your wharfage, just like all cool. the other companies that are down there. Excellent. Thank you very yeah, much. Very thank well. you, Mr. Chairman. Humidifier, humidity control. Um, how is that done? I have no idea. Well, that's that when we, we take a take a tour. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now the other uh, the other uh, construction project that isn't costing us a dime, isn't costing the community a dime, the private sector's building it, is Delta Western's new tank farm. Uh, they've leased, and, and for the last two and a half years now, they've leased from us about about two acres, a little over two acres of of property down there, and they started construction. Uh, on May the 1st of this year of the uh, of their new facility. Uh, when it's completed in total, there'll be six tanks that'll amount to another, let me do the math, 360,000 barrels of storage. Uh, their business plan is to build the tankage as their requirements for having storage at the port grow. So the first tank that they put in is gonna be for a new product we've never seen before, methanol. Uh, they have a they have a customer up on the slope for for that methanol. So once that tank is finished, uh, that's the first product that will come in across the dock and be stored in that tank and then and delivered on to uh, to the uh, to their customers up there. As I understand it, methanol is what you put down in the in the drill rigs down into the plumbing, so it doesn't freeze when you're not using when you're not using the drill rigs. So that when when they when they put those things in warm storage, if you will, and they're not using a methanol is what keeps everything from freezing. So that, and, and I'm sure there are other customers using it for other things, but, uh, but we're gonna have a 60,000 barrel methanol tank for starters down there. The tank is just about finished. Uh, they've been working on that for the last few months. Uh, where they are now is they have to connect the tank to the valve yard, which is where all the plumbing that comes off of the petroleum docks goes first before it goes out to the different terminals on the port. So they need to establish a presence within the valve yard to run their plumbing to the port. So they've got the whole ground torn up in our petroleum pipeline right of way area to put their pipe in and tie into the uh, and tie into the valve yard plumbing and that's what's going on now. What are the um, what are the completion dates for the two projects? Both have said that they want to try to be done before the end of the calendar year. Uh, and I think Delta Western is a little bit behind schedule. Permitting for a petroleum storage facility is a little more challenging than it was for for the guys putting in the cement storage. Is it so, shipped by truck? I'm Met sorry? Methanol shipped by truck or by? By rail and. By rail by up to Fairbanks. And, and by truck, because they're gonna put a, they're gonna put a truck fill stand there as well. Uh, <clears throat> Jennifer. Jennifer. Do you know what the status is as far as the tank farm over on the other side of the neck arm? No. I've heard a lot. Of, I've heard have a lot you of seen that. any building over there? Uh, not from where we're, not from the vantage point that we have, which is not to say it isn't happening. Because you know, we see the port, uh -huh. but then you got to go up that road to the flatlands at the top, and uh, and from the, from the dock facility to where any infrastructure would go up there is about a two mile drive anyway. Even so, for they're laying down yard that they're Yeah, and when the rail and when the rail line goes in, the rail line is going to terminate about two miles from the dock. Hmm. Okay. 
I mean, it's a, it's a big place, but there's no ready connection. That's why I like to tell people, and our rail is a quarter mile from there at the same elevation. Yeah. You don't have to go uphill to find it. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, I, think I, I should also mention that we just found out um, two weeks ago that Crowley, who already has a presence down at the port, got a contract with the Department of Defense to construct four more tanks for another 240,000 barrels of storage, all military, all military fuel. Um, it's the, the, the DOD has decided that their war reserve fuel stock that they've been keeping at a, at a terminal in Washington State is not with, with the plans to ship it up here as needed, and it made more sense to just put it here if there was space to put it. So uh, they put out a contract for bid, Crowley won the contract, so they're also constructing two more storage tanks. Do, we have, storage tanks. do we have space? Do we have space down there? have space to do it. Why yeah. not line up to the base and, and have the They already tank have a line up. to the base through, through the valve yard. Okay. They've had that for years. So that's how all the fuel moves from the port up the hill to their storage tanks. When all that construction is done, we'll have over 3 million barrels, 3.2 and a little bit million barrels of storage down the port. Are we running out of space? Yes. Hmm. Let's see, what, do you, what, are, what are your plans for that? Yeah, uh, well, we've got that, we've got the 60 acres out at the north end once we determine how much of the, I'm not counting that because when, you say, don't know how much is going to be space. left yet. Yeah. yeah, once we know how much is left, then I, then we can start to make plans for that. Yeah. It's kind of ahead of the ahead of the ball game to try and do that now. You know, we've been talking to the base about getting some acreage at the top of the bluff, somewhere near uh, as as overflow. And I've got a couple of other considerations to give that are off the port but close by, but. Uh, we haven't we haven't gotten ourselves in a situation yet where there's been a real problem we can't handle. You know, there's you know there's enough for anything that we've had to do that isn't the normal business. Um, we've been very successful in finding the space for it now, but uh, but my concern is being ready for when the, the gas line goes into goes into production. Is uh, you know, we don't know how much stuff will come in and how long it'll be here before it moves out, and we certainly don't want to miss out on those opportunities. So. Part of me is hoping that the, the land that's out there at the north end is available by then. Um, and then there are some other some other places nearby that are close to routes that people would take driving out of the port anyway, uh, that that would make good sense as a, as a plan B kind of, kind of location. Yeah. Uh, I want to welcome Mr. Abbott. Uh, okay. And and that you know that's that's the update on the on the two construction projects going on. Crowley's is about to begin, so uh, so I'll know more about that once they uh, once they start breaking ground to do their thing. What kind of volume are you doing with the airport? Is that picked up? Is uh, that uh, yes? Well, it, well it, it, it it has picked up to the point where we have gone from seeing four tankers in uh, 2013 to 14 in 2014 to 27 this year that are booked through the end of the year. We have. We have five count, five tankers booked. We haven't seen yet that are coming in this year. Wow! This is going to be the year. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to. I hope I'm not putting my reputation on the line, but I'm thinking this may be the year where petroleum pushes containers off the top of the heap as far as the big volume coming into the port. Yeah, it's that. The growth is that astounding, and uh, and John Parrott tells me it's the new norm. Uh, this is uh, this is an expected flow of business on the air, particularly on the air cargo side of the house, that isn't going to stop. Is the gas pipeline expected to go? I presume on the other side of the inlet. I mean, yeah, yeah. Point, Point McKenzie down to across. yeah, and, and down and across. Yeah, okay. probably not a bad idea. So that'll probably be helpful for the other port. Well, yeah. It, it, as I talk to the guys doing the logistics planning for this thing, <coughs> there isn't going to be a port in the state left out of the left out of the equation. They're going to be moving so much stuff on such a short span of time that they're going to need absolutely every marine terminal facility they can find to bring stuff in. Yeah. That's how much that's how much volume is going to be. I don't think the long pole in their tent is going to be docks. I think it's going to be truckers to start moving that stuff. Yeah, and they're worried about that too. How's your port project going? Well, that's an excellent segue. 
Thank you, Chair. Why don't you step aside now and, and give Mr. Hillich an opportunity to chat? Good morning. Good morning. So briefly, um, uh, it's been two months since we've talked about this. Um, as far as the PMO office itself, down to Port Department Management Office, um, we, we're implementing the electronic uh, document management sy system. Uh, we've been doing that for the last couple months. <clears throat> we've completed the testing phase and we're going to do training this next week. And that will uh, make sure the Muni and, and the Port and us has a complete uh, electronic document management uh, control system in place. Um, uh, for all the records uh, for the test file program, the permitting side, um, we've been working with uh, National Marine Fisheries uh, about the blue the whale to take and plot calculations. We've come to an agreement with them, um, and then uh, uh, we have been modifying the permit applications and the IHA uh, for our spring test file installation, and we've been getting a lot of uh, I think traction with the agencies. Um, it looks like we're on, on schedule to have our permits in place well before we actually do the work. Uh, for the marine design, uh, task order five, we've prepared what we, uh, it's a long title, an evaluation of design alternatives to satisfy the GAC recommended seismic performance requirements. And basically what that is is to uh, compare the current ASCE uh, standards that we're proposing to follow and you know, we're already uh, going to uh, increase the uh, category of seismic design and we're working to analyze whether we can meet the uh, additional request from the GAC and what, it, what the impact of the program would be. We've completed that draft report we've briefed the report on it. So um, uh, we're going back and making a few changes to that report based on their comments. Is that, excuse me, uh, is that going to change the standard such that you're going to have to change contracts or no, what, it, what is? Okay. No, sir, it is, it really is, you, do, you design the various levels of, of uh, uh, safety. seismic uh, categories for various levels of uh, seismic uh, reoccurrence. In our case, uh, we, it only affects two terminals. And we feel, you know, we, we were already increasing the category that we wanted to design to make sure those two terminals were still functional after a seismic event. And the GACs ask us to uh, see if, if we can uh, bring it up a little higher, considering the unique location of the port. In their words, um, the fact that there's no other port that can take the uh, fill in if, if, uh, if our terminals are out of, out of commission for a while. So we're working on that, and we found, I think, some very unique, um, I, I'll just say I'm very pleased with the unique uh, 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 solutions that my design team came up with, and they're relatively, uh, uh, we found we could do uh, for some impact what could be what was requested, and now the court will be looking at that. And then eventually we'll brief the GAC on it. But it'll be a municipal decision as to whether we proceed with those requirements or not. Um, when when is that decision expected? I mean, when are we going to be asked for that kind of decision? We tentatively we would like it by the end of this year, mm -hmm. early next spring. It really goes into effect when we do the when we go into the design uh, towards the end of next year, and we procure a designer record. We need to have <coughs> the requirements at hand for that. Cool. Um, for the landside buildings, uh, we have completed the uh, programming reports on the uh, landside buildings that would have to be moved off of Terminal 1. We've given that to the port. And right now, we're, we're basically waiting to see um, uh, if and when we want to proceed and uh, uh, exactly how we want to proceed with the uh, rain for design build contractor. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on the landside side investigation with the municipality vendors. Uh, surveying geotechnical uh, sampling, um, uh, both aerial and land surveying, and that it is uh, going well, and in some cases is coming to an end, and that's allowing us to, to work on the North Extension Stabilization Project. Uh, we're doing a civil design on that. Um, and then we started the permitting for the entire program, uh, and we've had two meetings. One's been with uh, uh, all the agencies <coughs> to discuss the various uh, uh, approaches we could take to permitting, whether we do it as one major permit or we break it up into two smaller permits, and uh, uh, how it would be formatted as far as an EA. Um, 
environmental assessment or anything like that. And we've held a separate meeting with the Corps over the 408 process. Uh, it's basically because we're going to be building in a, a federal project, a dredge project, we need to get a 408 permit uh, from the Corps to allow that to happen. And we're going to be doing some modeling of the sedimentation and the hydrodynamics of our structures. Um, so that's all going well. There's been no change orders, no uh, we're on schedule on track for all of that. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly about the Kiwit contract. Um, the, we, uh, we have, we are actually, as of today, have started work on the geotech drilling. Uh, they're drilling actually this morning. They're setting up on Terminal 2, and they will be drilling probably for the next two to three weeks at various various locations around the verse. Um, they'll be uh, coordinating with the port to make sure that they're out of the way of the vessels. So um, we've been working for the last month to answer some questions they raised on their geotechnical work plan. We worked with uh, uh, SHPO and with NIMPS and been able to get relief on, on their means and methods without having to get, actually get permanent modifications or any cost impacts to Kiwit. So um, they're able to start actually on schedule today. Is this to get core samples? They're drilling down basically, um, I do not believe it's core samples, I believe it's more uh, 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 characteristic samples. Uh, they'll be bringing up some core samples, but we need to go down to the full depth of the pile. We know the first 100 feet really well. We don't know the next 100 feet. We didn't do that last time? I mean, we they didn't. They weren't anticipating the deep depth of piles that were. <coughs> so, um, we, it's, it's really to to uh, reaffirm the pile length. Uh, we took in a rather conservative approach on the pile length, and it's possible that, that, that um, may the designer may be short, able to shorten it up, save some money, and some time. So. Questions? No, thank sure. you. Sure. Sure. Are you finished? You're yes. not finished. Yes, right. Right. Okay. Um, just for my curiosity, what was the cost of the electronic management system? Um, actually, there's some internal labor, and that's it. Mm -hmm. It's an in-house system that mm -hmm. we own, and so um, uh, we're putting uh, one of our uh, EDMS uh, document control managers uh, on it, and that's it. That's only comes. Um, and then, just for clarification, because um, just some institutional knowledge, these monthly meetings um, came out of when we approved the CH2M held contract. And it was, because I'm not sure if Mr. Abbott is aware of this either, but it was part of the assembly approval to have a monthly update so that the assembly would not um, go to sleep, um, basically. And, and this update can either be in writing or it can be in a formal committee, but it's, 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 Part of the approval for CH2 and help Can I follow up? Just so the administration now, I mean, it's, and, and it doesn't necessarily, and what happened then we pulled in MLMP because that was another large construction project, and so they became part of the reporting. Um, but it is something that, as I say, it, it can be by written documentation or it can be a, a formal committee, um, just so the chair knows and, and so the staff Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Um, Johnson. Um, I remember that happening, but I also remember the Enterprise Committee um, being established because of um, uh, issues, not issues, I don't want to call issues, but general government and, and saving money with general government. And then, you know, your intent was to have the utilities do the same thing. So I remember the committee oh, no. being established for that purpose no, also. That, and I that, just. That and is, I just thought I would yeah. mention that. No, that was so. also part of the, the, yeah. the committee. Yeah. This, this aspect of it, this reporting as far as construction projects, I just wasn't sure. I'm not sure if yeah. Mr. was on the committee at the time, and I knew that Mr. Abbott was uh -huh. not familiar with this. So I just thought while I was sitting here, it was a chance to well, remind folks. Valid point. I, I'm hoping that we get uh, both both MLMP and, and uh, the port uh, start getting the flow di diagram again in terms of, um, you know, task and where you are on the task and that kind of thing. And I don't know, I don't know if the project has changed to the extent that that's not valid, but it seemed to me that was a useful uh, product that we got on a monthly basis and we were able to track it a little bit better. So, uh, 
future reference. Um, Mr. Traney, welcome. Thank you, sir. I'm like, <coughs> I, ha I didn't notice. <laughs> we'll have to doctor really that. Um, anything we'll else you, you want to pass on to <laughs> us in terms of what's going on, what's great? Uh, I did have a question also about berms. Are you going to have to re-berm or berm differently based upon the methanol and the, uh, the new tanks that you've got in there? I'll give you the layman's answer. It's a marketing major answering an engineering question. Uh, no. The whole terminal is, is burned. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to take the leap of faith that in the permitting process they were told how to do it right for you. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, methanol, a little bit different product than, than get, you, know, the, you know, regular gasoline is. I don't know if from a safety perspective it requires more or less. I just know that part of that berm is a is a concrete wall, and and um, and the first thing they did was dig down about 10, 12 feet to begin to build the bathtub that all the tanks are going to go into. So that you know that was all that's done first, and that's the way. And, and then they line it uh, with a uh, you know with a, some kind of material uh, liner, put the drainage systems in for water, put the oil and water separator in for everything else. And, and all that's been done according to code, and uh, they've not had a work stoppage related to any kind of a code violation. It's mostly been degree of difficulty in the construction that was unanticipated. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? That's it. That's it. All right. MLMP. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Or AWW, pardon me. Would you like AWW first? Well, yeah, I better take AWW because I had them on the agenda. <laughs> Do, are we going to need this? I don't know if we're going to need this. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, guys. I uh, jumped the gun. So I'm Steve Ness, I'm the Capital Program Manager for the Anchorage Water and Wastewater Utility. Um, Brett couldn't be here today, um, he had some other plans to leave, but he wanted me to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing out at Aspen, and yesterday he gave this big 50 slide presentation to the board, and I'm not going to give you a 50 slide presentation, um, about 10 minutes here, high flyover of stuff, and if you guys want more detailed information just ask as we go through, it's kind of informal here. Um, so, you know, investing in Aspen, I call this uh, Anchorage's quiet, critical asset. You have the port, you have um, the airport, that pound on the table all the time about how critical they are, and I just like to say, without us guys, you guys wouldn't be here, so, you know. <laughs> it would be knee deep in yeah. something. A um, little bit, uh, just want to go over the capital investment, the operational investment, some of the regulatory compliance things that, that we have going on and also the long-term planning that we're taking into consideration as we move forward with our investment in Aspen. So Aspen sits out there by the airport. Um, it's Anchorage's wastewater treatment facility, but it's also a regional treatment facility in the fact that we take a lot of septage and we treat the septage from the valley that currently comes into the Anchorage system. So, you know, whether or not it's Anchorage's asset, it's a regional asset as well. So it serves all of the Anchorage um, metropolitan census area, which goes all the way out in Palmer and, and Wasilla and stuff like that when you look at it from an economic perspective. Um, recently, over the last five years, we've completed a little over $12 million of projects. Um, the key focus there has been on maintaining our assets. Um, we had to do a whole bunch of generator and electrical improvements um, to, to bring it up to code, make sure that we had enough backup power to, to, you know, previously our generators were sized to only be able to run a portion of the plant. We increased the generator sizes so we could run all of the plant 
in a power outage. We also have two electrical feeds in the plant that let it to be kind of wonky. Um, when there was a power outage, you get one part of the plant that would run and one part of the plant that wouldn't run. So we, we kind of fixed all that. Um, we had to do some fire and sprinkler code upgrades to comply with FM global requirements of our insurance. We've done a lot of concrete preservation. We have thousands and thousands of yards of concrete out there that get exposed to the sewage on a daily basis and we have to protect it regularly. You know, about every 20 years we have to go in there and give it a good cleaning and coating and things like that. So we've done a lot of preservation work on our concrete. Um, we've made some storage upgrades as, as we've done improvements around the plant and added equipment and processes. All our storage space keeps on getting shrunk smaller and smaller and we don't have the space that we need anymore for spare parts and chemicals and things like that. Um, Utilidors, a lot of our process piping and everything out there at Aspen runs and buried Utilidors. Well, we did all this upgrades to the electrical system, but we had Utilidors that were leaking water during rain events on top of all this brand new electrical system. So we had to go and fix these leaks, unearth the top of the Utilidors, waterproof and things like that. So, you know, 12 and a half million uh, roughly over the last five years. And then starting in 2013, we began the process of looking at our facility and preparing a facility plan. We do facility plans for all our treatment sites um, every seven to 10 years. It gives us a holistic look of where things are going, what we need to do to be in compliance with regulatory uh, concerns that may be coming down the line, as well as you know what's failing, what's you know our operational cost on a specific piece of equipment, should we replace it? When should we replace it? Those kind of things. So we looked at regulatory compliance issues. We looked at what we call non-process improvements, building upgrades, concrete preservation work, code compliance things, and then also process improvements, things that are related to replacing you know, the incinerator or any other type of actual process treatment equipment. All of the assumptions that we made when we did the facility plan between 2013 and 2014 assumed we were still able to operate for at least the next 10 years under 301H provisions of the Clean Water Act, which gives us a wet waiver from secondary treatment requirements. So um, regulatory requirements, five big items there. Air compliance, we incinerate all the sludge that, that uh, we have at our plant. Um, we have to make sure we comply with air permit requirements. They're getting more stringent. Um, you know, we've, we've been investing a lot heavily just in personnel alone with environmental compliance on that. Wastewater discharge, we want to make sure that we're maintaining uh, environmental reporting, compliance, monitoring, so we can maintain our 301H provisions. Residuals management um, with our sludge, making sure with our ash sludge, and then also our screenings that we're complying with discharge requirements um, to the air also for the ash and screenings that we send out to the landfill. Stormwater, we have to ensure that we, everything that comes on our site, um, you know, we treat properly and it doesn't run off. You know, we have a multi-sector general permit there. And then the risk management program, prior to April uh, of this year, AWW was using gaseous chlorine for disinfection out at Aspen. We've had a proj project in the works since 2006 that's under construction right now, and I'll get to that in a second. That moves us from a gaseous chlorine to a high strength bleach disinfectant. And um, you know, we had 40 tons of gaseous chlorine stored out at Aspen at any one time out there, which created a huge risk in terms of life if something was ever to happen out there and the wind was blowing wrong. You know, you could have really impacted a large portion of this community. So um, now that we're not using gaseous chlorine, we can deregister from having followed the risk management program requirements. So what's underway right now, um, a $19.6 million project to move us from gaseous chlorine to um, sodium hypochlorite, high strength bleach. We're gonna generate it on site. Uh, interesting discussion here with the, the concrete storage down there because to generate this bleach, we have to have salt. We have to have salt in huge quantities. He's our our contractor <laughs> from, from Univar is saying, you know, you could really do better if you can go to a whole barge load of salt in one fell swoop and just construct yourself a storage facility like at the port or someplace because the, the specific type of salt we need is only manufactured in Mexico in one facility and in uh, Utah in another facility. And so there's, there's, you know, 
buying in bulk saves you money um, at times and also handling and things like that. So um, that may be something that we're looking at down the road, but we're gonna be using a lot of salt. We're gonna be bringing a lot of salt in through the port and having to haul it. Um, we've also got other projects going on. Um, we're upgrading the air quality analyzers on our scrubber units. We're doing additional painting work out there. We're doing seismic code analysis and upgrades. Um, there's hot water systems that we use to clean the screens out there. We have screens that take all the big chunks out of the water that we replaced 10, 11 years ago that now need a major overhaul just because of the environment that they're in and the wear and tear that they get from 24 seven operation. Um, we have, there's a beach tower down there. It's graffiti filled, but that beach tower that's out uh, off Port Warren's off park is actually designed to help um, maintain our chlorine or our disinfection contact time with, with our effluent before it discharges in there. So the water comes in down at the bottom, bubbles up to the top, and then falls over a dividing wall there. Well, with all the storms and things like that, we've seen a lot of the bluff slide from behind there, and we're concerned about the erosion, so we've got a project going on there to help stabilize that embankment and protect that beach tower, because if that beach tower fails, we don't have the necessary chlorine contact time before we discharge out in the inlet. We also have a couple things like our sludge dewatering. Um, we have belt filter presses that, that smush the sludge cake out, get the water out of it before we can put it in the incinerator. Um, and those belts are 30 years old and we can't find pieces and parts for them anymore. We have guys at our, our, our shops hand manufacturing pieces when we need them to keep them in maintenance. So. Um, We've got a lot of improvements currently going on, over 30 million. Moving forward over the next six years, on our sewer side of the house, we have about a total $125 million uh, capital improvement plan. $23 million of that roughly, or about one fifth of it, we're planning on future investments into Aspen just to keep it operational and running. These were things that were identified in our facility plan um, between 2013 and 2014. Why is all this important? Um, well, hold on. Let's talk about operational investment. Um, right now, to run Aspen, to make sure it's environmentally compliant um, and, and, and keep everything running smoothly, we spend a little over $7 million a year um, out there. We have 27 staff that work out there um, or, or assist with environmental compliance and pretreatment requirements out there. Um, that $7 million represents over 42% of our total treatment budget between water treatment and sewer treatment costs. So this is a big component of our operational budget out there. And it's important to keep it running. Um, our guys, these are a couple of them over there on the right hand side, they do an excellent job. We've been recognized year after year with national awards, um, the NACWA National Association of Clean Water Agencies peak awards for compliance with regulatory requirements. So every year, um, gold is a yearly, platinum is every five years of compliance. So we, we've been doing really good. We have one long standing track record out there. Why is this investment required? Um, our operational permit technically expired in November, uh, August of 2005. We got it administratively extended in 2009 uh, during President Obama's visit here uh, in August, the EPA Region 10 director made it a point to come and seek out the mayor saying, hey, you know, we're, we're coming, we, we can't hold off on, on looking at your permit any longer. And, and to operate under the 301H provisions, there's nine criteria that you have to meet to be able to comply. One, you have to be a, a marine discharge, that's the overarching thing, but you also have to make sure that you're having a balanced indigenous um, wildlife, fish, a population, you have an environmental monitoring program in place, you have a robust pretreatment program in place, um, you're not constrained, straining other dischargers, there's no other discharges other than upper cook them in. Um, we're maintaining toxic control from other sources and we do a good job of that with the solid waste services, um, household hazardous waste program, and a lot of our pretreatment work, especially out on base, you know, we used to have a lot of effluent coming from base that wasn't compliant, but we've been working a lot in the last 10 years to make sure that 
the base and the people on base know what they can and can't discharge in their system. Um, we meet all our current permit limitations and that we remove at least 30% of biological oxygen demand and total suspended solids from our effluent. Um, we're regulatory compliant. We, we do monitoring, testing, daily basis, weekly basis, quarterly basis, on a yearly basis. We have a prescribed set of tests. We send out a report every single year. And our guys, we do great. One of the things that we have going forward is that we don't have a lot of industrial discharges in our waste stream. So, so we have relatively clean influent coming in before we go out. But we publish on a yearly basis our, our report uh, summarizes all our monitoring and it's about you know yay thick of data if you guys really want to get into the nuts and bolts of it but we're regulatory compliant um, our effluent approaches secondary effluent discharges um, we, we, we don't quite get the full percentage of biological oxygen demand removal that we need but in terms of total suspended solids we're pretty darn close to meeting secondary effluent standards already we have more than 20 years of monitoring data, and through all that data, um, you know, we've met all our permit conditions over the years. Our effluent has low trace amounts of other contaminants, cocaine, ibuprofen, you name it, you know, we're pretty low when it comes to all that. Um, Cook Inlet has naturally high levels of trace metals from discharge from placer streams, so whatever we discharge in there is well below what the native background is. Um, we don't have any toxicity, you know, they've taken fish samples and things like that. We don't have to show any influence from our effluent in terms of the fish. Um, there's no sedimentation at the outfall. There's no bioaccumulation in algae near the outfall. Um, and aspirin primary effluent is approximately equal to secondary effluent elsewhere. So we think, you know, through 20 years of data, we're a good case for 301H reauthorization. And you know, when it comes, we've got the data in the background and the investment to prove that we've been investing in it, we've been maintaining it, we've been monitoring it, and you know, we're ensuring that we have a balanced indigenous population. But we also have to plan the what if scenarios. So end of 2014, um, early 2015, we start taking a look you know, if we are forced to go to secondary treatment standards, what would it cost? And a lot of it depends upon the assumptions that are out there. And these are order of magnitude estimates, but if we, right now we treat about 30 million gallons a day, we'd say, well, we'd have to treat peak flows, either there's two options, either a peak flow of around 43 million gallons a day or an instantaneous peak flow of around 58 million gallons a day. There's a big cost differential of about $100 million to be able to treat those um, different flows. If we're forced to go to what's considered advanced secondary or almost tertiary treatment, which is where a lot of the regulatory agencies think they may be going, we could be as high as 750 million or more. Um, to put that into perspective, when we spend capital dollars and close it to plant and put it in service, depending upon the type of asset and whether or not it's the water or sewer utility, that equates to either, a, for every $10 million that we spend in capital, it's either a 70 to 90 cents per month cost increase to our residential rate payers. So a, 75, a $750 million project that all of a sudden we put into <coughs> service could be 60 to $70 a month rate increase for a residential oh, homeless okay. if, we're, if we have to pay everything. Yes, Ms. Johnson. Go. Um, <coughs> Couple questions. One is, uh, did you see? Dixie? I thought the valley had developed their own wastewater treatment plant. Their their septage hall, their septage disposal facility. They have a group meeting currently, uh -huh. but they're running in some stumbling blocks with getting going and and the cost of it and everything like that. But right now and for the foreseeable future, we'll still be taking septage from the valley. So we're looking at least five years out. Yes. How old is our incinerator? Um, so we have an old incinerator that we're getting ready to tear down. Yeah. Um, and then our other incinerator was 1983, 86. That then I upgraded through a project in 2007. 
uh, and put in new scrubber technology and air control technology there. And so we're looking for a few more years out where we're gonna have to do another investment to comply with air permit requirements. Have you started, I couldn't tell, did you start on the, the construction of the sludge dehydrator? No, we, we, that, that's planned for two years from now, roughly. Okay. So the incinerator and dehydrator will probably go arm in arm the, 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 the belt filter press presses or the sludgy watering needs to be done first. The, the reason I, uh, Brett and I keep missing, but we're going to sit down. I, I <clears throat> saw this technology in, in, in BC now that does dehydrating and incineration. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a $10 million unit. Yeah. Cool. So, Cheap. You know, for. Our, our scrubber is the largest water consumer in the city. Yeah. We, we subsidize our, our, our water utility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and it, to, to be able to meet our air permit requirements, we use more water than any other single entity in the city. So this, this unit is a waste waste to energy, actually a waste to, to carbon producer. So it's, its purpose isn't for this, but it seems to me like a great Okay. And that's something we can definitely start. Yeah, so I'll, you know, maybe you can sit on that meeting and take a look at the stuff I have and see what you think of it. Thank you. Okay. Have you looked at Hall Lowe's experience? I think they're going to tertiary. Yes, so, so right the now. The cost uh, is outrageous. It, 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 it's outrageous. They're a bigger facility than we are, too. So across the United States right now, there's approximately 36 plants that operate under 301H provisions. In Alaska, there's nine of them, us and Wrangell and a couple other marine discharges that operate. Um, Honolulu just signed a 30-year uh, implementation plan to move from, from primary to secondary treatment, and it's like $2 billion or something like that. I, I've got to go back to the news articles, but it's a huge investment for them. But fortunately, they've got a 30-year window to make that transition because it's also it's their main Honolulu plant, and I think it's also their Sand Lake, or whatever it's called. They're, they have two plants that they've got to modify, so that's part of what's leading the cost there. So when will the feds be up here on the 301 age recertification? Any idea? <coughs> you know, it's next time the president comes what, or what? What they tell the mayor? Yeah. Uh, they didn't give the mayor an exact date. They just said, you know, we can't avoid not working on it anymore. You know, they gave they gave us a draft permit in 2009 re-ripped it to shreds because it was poorly written it didn't take into consideration a lot of the science that we had back there because we ripped it to shreds they said well we'll just give you an administrative extension and um you know it could be another five years now is that every year we have to go back from administrative extension or is it we have not had any additional administrative extension since 2009. thank you sir so we're out of compliance no we're yeah. we're in compliance because it's administratively, indefinitely administratively extended. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Could they finish? Uh, you have more? Uh, just two more, real quick. Okay. If it moves. Um, a lot of discussion. The land exchange is off the table, but planning for the future, we may need our land reserves out there. We have the 111 acres. We've, through this exercise of looking at what it would cost, we've also looked at what we would need land-wise uh, in terms of additional land be beyond what we currently have. Um, if we just go with option one or two and, and have to just do a secondary treatment, it's about another 15 to 17 acres of land. If we have to go to advanced secondary, it's an additional 25 to 30 acres of land. And that doesn't include things like, you know, vegetative buffer and screening and snow storage and stuff like that. So, you know, concept wise over here on the left is what we currently look like and north is facing that way. You can see that if we have to go to a advanced secondary, we almost triple the footprint of what we currently are out there. So, you know, preservation of something is important. Being able to move this facility to a completely brand new site um, to be able to do treatment. Find me a 60 acre site in anchorage that's available. If you went out that way, would you miss the trail or would you be beyond the trail? The trail is on the north side, oh, the north side. or the, on, on this part, the top okay. part of the screen. I got you. Here. So that's that space supposedly in their plan in between the runway. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Visitors are always welcome. Elby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I just want to say thank you very much for this great presentation. It was really informational for me. Um, just one little criticism. You and I both uh, refer to what's at the dome at the port as uh, concrete, and Steve doesn't like that. It's not concrete, it's cement. It's cement. cement. I so we got to work on that. Well, in his case, both it is concrete. <laughs> <laughs> it's concrete. It's shot feet, right? It's a shot feet dome. Got to know your product. Thank you. Um, it's coming at some point in time, uh, you know, in terms of having to do having to do the upgrade. Uh, what do you say? What did you say? Thirty-six in the USA that are thirty-six in the U.S. primary that, treatment that, that have primary treatment. Nine of them are in Alaska. Now, do, does anybody point to the decline in belugas as a result of your discharge, uh, our discharge? There, there, there are some that have speculated that the science from all our bioassays, the modeling of the inlets and the flows, and where. Um, our effluent goes compared to where the belugas congregate don't support that. All right, sounds good. Okay. Um, can we have a little bit? Uh, we may have to extend a few minutes if anybody has a problem, but I would like to hear from uh, from MLP. Let's see, uh, see what you got. And you are. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Seven members. Thank you. Uh, this is a, we weren't on the schedule, but it had been a couple months since we had last reported, so we wanted to get in front of you uh, at a minimum. The report in front of you shows that the project uh, on a contract is up. Terms have not changed. Still due to, to be completed June 2016. Safety stats. Project is a high point of this project. Continues to be more than 50 percent below both Alaska and national safety OSHA incidents. Lost time in the incident rates, which is great. Progress on site. There's been a significant amount of progress since the last book to the oversight committee. The large utility grade transformers are now in their containment pits. The Auxiliary transformers in place, the black start diesel to start up the plant and or the rail belt if necessary is in place. The connections to AWW's ERS project, large three foot diameter cooling water pipes and the smaller 20 inch diameter inlet chilling pipes are in place. So we are now connected to AWW and they have a separate project that they continue to build up and we are building up that way. We're working on the periphery buildings of the main power block building, specifically the pump house in front of the cooling tower, a high voltage connection to MLP's existing transmission yard called GIS, gas insulated switch gear yard, is up. It's a separate 30 foot tall building. And uh, advanced switching equipment will be going into that building soon. Down around the back of the project behind uh, the CEA 230 yard is our gas compressor house that is getting ready to go up. Gas compressors are on site today and are being placed. That's the, what the big crane is there for. And finally, the inlet filter houses that uh, filter the air going into the gas turbines are being placed now by the large crane. The cranes will go away at that after this and um, work will continue. However, there's a bunch of uh, mole hills and uh, excavations as contractor continues to do underground drains, fire and water loop, and electrical dump banks, pretty much 360 degrees around the project. And winter's coming, so it's um, an issue. NSTAR's pipe is connected to NSTAR and down to the project, and so we're getting close to the utility connections for water, electrical, ACS, gas. Sewer's another story. Here in the next week or two, we will contractor will be extending the sewer down Starview Drive, the frontage road in front of the old plant to, to the connection point with AWW at uh, the Centennial Campground. Again, uh, we could have a foot of frost and growing by this time of year, and so the weather is being very kind to the contractor at this point. Up on the roof, the roof is done, but the, it's in a high wind zone, 100 
120 mile an hour rated zone to be, being close to the mountains. So there's this, this the flat parapet roof needs to have these uh, pavers put on to hold the roof down so it doesn't become a sail in a, in a large wind event. So those those pavers are going up at this time. And within, within the plant, lots of piping, welding, electrical, more electrical continues. There's almost, or about 80 electricians on site. There's about 250 men and women on site. It is a buzzing hive of construction activity. So that's the general status of construction at this point. Schedule. Project is currently trailing the contractor's schedule. As I noted a second ago, the civil work continues, and at this point in the project, you would want to be up and out of the ground. And so, if, as winter comes, it just makes it that much harder to work in the ground with, with uh, artificial heating, etc. But the contractor will need to get out of the ground soon. We sent a, a letter, a notice of uh, schedule slippage to the contractor last Friday, and we're requesting a recovery plan. So what does this mean? We see 30 to 60 days behind at this point. June 12, 2016 is contractual substantial completion, the, the, the point in time at which we were supposed to receive utility grade power. And we're not seeing it. Our owner's engineer, IEC, with lots of experience is saying we're not seeing it. There is a lot of reasons for this. Uh, fits and starts within engineering project manager change at Quanta's level, and uh, general material mismanagement, uh, valves not being ordered in time and, and being delayed or other, other critical material that is holding up critical path on the project. But uh, nonetheless, that's what we're seeing. We've uh, walked with the contractor for a long time, and we're, we're, we're officially putting them on notice that we're not seeing that. What does that mean for us? Well, within the contract, there's significant substantial or so liquidated damages clauses that were calculated um, to make the MLP whole from a, at a business level for having to run its older inefficient turbines longer. So really, it's a net zero to MLP, but it, it nonetheless will be a black mark on the contractor if, they, if that happens. So that's where we're at. Mark, do you want to speak about uh, change orders and budget? Could, could I just ask? Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. So the the project manager that was there from the beginning is no longer there. Yes, ma'am. Quanta is a conglomerate construction company, multi-billion dollar outfit. They're, to best my knowledge, they're a consortium of 30 construction and engineering companies. And they took a wholly owned EPC contractor company that they own out of Denver and sidelined them and brought in a new outfit called Phoenix Power Group that they also own and said, you're failing and here, take it over. And they did that this spring. And uh, we observed that, made us nervous, but we have a parent guarantee with Quanta Corporate and so it's really under the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the means and methods of the contractor to execute the project. Because in our previous reports, of course, we got some growing reports and, and they were way ahead of schedule. Were you seeing any slippage before they replaced the management? Yes, um, they were. They were t touting that they think thought they could be ahead of schedule, and in fact, we think that they changed project managers because they were all wet about that, and, and or didn't fully understand what they were doing. And and. But you didn't. Your, the safety records still remained the same, and and the quality of work still remained the same. So you don't feel that there's any aspect of that contract where that 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 the quality of work wasn't there. It just they were still right. in time. So so I, 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 the short answer is yes. I believe the quality of work is still there. However, on the owner's side, representation side, IEC Corporation is representing MLP and MOA. They're having to uh, paddle harder and wag their finger at the contractor, how oh, you can't do that, or or we see the these NCRs or these problems. And so in order to keep the quality up, we are IEC is working very hard in our owner's representation. But, but yes, I, I have no issues with the quality of the project. It's it's literally 
uh, schedule at this point. You can you can get there many ways, but at some point your choices affect your critical path to completion. Does that mean does that mean we're spending more on oversight than uh, than we plan to or had been spending on? Yes, sir. Uh, that's a good question, and it ab absolutely does. The one contract that I will, I will be bringing forth the assembly for approval here in the next uh, uh, cycle or two is a contract amendment for increased funds to IEC to oversee the contractor. This is for several reasons. An example of uh, ways and means or means and methods. Uh, Prudence would say you would. there's so much piping. There's miles and miles of piping within this project. Prudence would say you do as much of that in a shop location off-site as, as possible, and then you x-ray and inspect that off-site. This contractor is chose to do everything in the field, and that costs more time and labor in the field. It's generally more expensive overall, and generally harder to uh, do special inspection, x-ray, which is special inspection is within the purview of owner's um, uh, oversight, IEC. So we have more costs for uh, like the last industrial x-ray to inspect on site and, and that's the root. So the one area that this is, we're feeling it is, is in the, our owner's oversight contract. And do you have a feel for that yet? Yes ma'am, we will be bringing a change order through, uh, uh, like say in the next two to four weeks, uh, it'll be $3 million. Mm. So it's sizable. It's sizable. Now the project as a whole is, as part will show you, is uh, well under budget. It's, it's more than $15 million under budget. And this is the one contract that we need to uh, address within the several contracts. For example, the GE contract is several million dollars under budget. And in fact, um, the Quanta contract, all, all change orders are owner directed at this point. We're only 20% uh, spent on the change order authority within the Quanta $200 million contract. So this is the one area that the, it was an estimate at the time to completion. And as we went to contract with Quanta and evolved with them, we see that their choices are probably less than stellar. And it's, and it's affecting us. Are those additional costs recoverable? Not under the contracts, no. Dick? Do you have any input on Quanta's changing of contractors? <laughs> What's your name, sir? Well, can you tell them, hey, we want what the company had there before? Or are we just stuck with who they've given us? You said they changed. Yeah. The company out. Back in March, we saw that they were slipping. They're, they're touting their six months ahead of schedule. We even brought that to this body and said, hey, they say they're ahead of schedule. We're not seeing it. But, um, and they were, they were making some very big errors in engineering and moves that affected their project as a whole. The Quanta corporate saw that and elected to make this change. We uh, observed, we sent memos of observation and uh, 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 what is your plan, rectification plan. However, uh, legal, it, it, you can only mess with the pie so, so much, much before you own it. And this was a decision made by them, we observed it and they still own schedule, cost, and, uh, and all the terms within the contract. Thank you. Other questions? Um, real, real fast, I want to go through the uh, budget and the change orders part. Sure. <clears throat> just give you, um, Eugene has uh, touched on a couple of things. The project is Excuse me, just a minute. Let me, let me extend us for uh, till uh, quarter after. <clears throat> go ahead. Okay. Um, the, the, Financial sheet in front of you is what you've historically seen. We are basically uh, moving along consistently with what we projected. What I would like to do though is just take a couple minutes and give you a flavor of what is changing and what you're going to be seeing changes in the near future on. And we expect to really provide you a full new projection in January as we move into the last quarter of this project. So under the Quanta project, um, with change order number eight, which is currently in our uh, signature process, it's going to move that committed column on that contract above our projected column. 
However, here probably in about uh, 120 days, we are going to be moving about $2 million off of the Quanta contract. And this is a reimbursable line item that we have for spare parts and equipment for the plant startup. But because we went to a two-year warranty, we're not going to have to make that investment, so that money will come off of the contract. So we're going to go up, and then we're going to come back down. So that's just to let you know that that, that will be occurring. We also have about another $150,000 in change orders that are in the mill right now. And as we look down the road, um, we're seeing fewer and fewer change orders, but we can't guarantee that there won't be some other fit and finish items that we'll have to bring through as the project progresses. The GE contract, that current commitment of 54 million, we're projected at 51. We are we still believe that's a good number, and we are currently working with GE to remove three and a half million dollars off this contract. That again was for spare parts and equipment. Um, most of that was picked up uh, through existing inventory at MLMP because of the aero derivative uh, platform that they are now moving to, and they already have an LM 2500. And the other componentry that they did need, they are basically picking up through their warehouse account, so we don't have to pick it up on the capital side. So that money will be coming off the contract. The IEC contract, <coughs> currently committed at 11.4. Our projection this last January was 12.4, and as Eugene just pointed out, we're really seeing, that's where we're seeing the big increase. Um, we're bringing through a change order now for $3 million, and that will bring that number up to 14.4. In addition to the increased um, uh, testing and, and uh, in x-ray services, which has substantially impacted the IEC contract. They also brought on additional resources to oversee the contractor, especially in the instrumentation and controls component. And we're also using them pretty extensively right now to provide white papers and engineering for um, decommissioning, uh, BTU transfer between us and AWU, and some run plan activity, which we have to project forward on the plant. So there's a number of services that uh, IEC is providing as part of this contract. It's not all just on the construction side. So that is driving that $3 million increase. Builder's risk, <coughs> that's an insurance policy. Uh, to date, we have no claims, and we don't see any coming down the road, um, barring any force majeure event, earthquake, or something else. So we're in good shape there. The AFUDC. Uh, as you can see, we were committed at 28 million. Our projection was 20 million. When we reproject this in January, I would tell you right now that we will probably remove another five to eight million dollars off this line item. So this will bring the overall project cost uh, well under our 300 million dollar target. Our A and G is uh, pretty much moving on target. Other expenses are on target, and our infrastructure projects are on target. So overall, while the numbers are shifting in between the line items a little bit, we're very, very confident that this project um, will come in under the $300 million number that we have here today, but we are going to have to shuffle that. Uh, but, but is there a change in scope? <coughs> are you getting less as well? No. No. It's... Um, I, you know, I will tell you the one thing that we always have to be cautious with is that if there's ever a claim on the project, it's never at this point. The claims come in at right at the end when they're missing schedule and they want to put blame on the owner and then you end up, you know, having to fight your way through that a little bit. Um, We've heard some noises that the engineering firm may be making a claim against their own in uh, Quanta. The Stantec engineering may be making a claim to Quanta. Now, we don't know what that looks like at this point, but if that is uh, substantial, and we suspect it is, that they may try to push on us to reimburse them 
if, if they um, fail to mitigate that claim. So it, it doesn't mean that we are totally out of the woods. We can only project and tell you what we know, and that's the only thing we know coming down the pipe. As Eugene mentioned, if we're correct in our assessment that their float on the project is basically down to zero, and if they do push uh, 30 to 60 days, they're looking at uh, liquidated damages to the tune of $30,000 a day. That's about $3 million um, every 10 days. You know, so or three hundred thousand about a million a month. So it, it adds up fairly quickly. The first thing that the contractor will move to is try to show information that is our fault on the ML owner side to try to mitigate those losses. So I, I'm not going to hold out right now and tell you there is not going to be a, a push yeah. on their side to try to recover that. It, Gen Jennifer, you had a question. It was just part of the game. Just, just for curiosity, the first round of dirt work that was done called Design to Quantum, is that in that $300 million or is that separate? The infamous dirt work? There's two components that were, um, that you, you probably didn't notice the first one. The first one was actually the removal of the hill that was down there. That was about a $2 million contract, and that is embedded in our other cost. That was a part of the project cost. The second phase of that is when we went up above the project and did what we called the SSSA project, which was the clearing and leveling of the upper terrace, and that was not part of this project. That was funded separately through a separate capital. That started as a replacement of the gas pipelines in yeah. 2 and PREPA, the delivery point to plant 2A and we need to make <coughs> space available to build this project or else we'll have higher That was the one that had the large cost overrun. Correct. And, that was, and I just, I think in, in, in transparency, we, we need to also just have that in our back of our head as one of the costs. Still was cost, yeah. Go ahead. Or, that, that's it. I, uh, basically, we're, we're on track otherwise. And, um, Everything is looking actually pretty well financially. Put the <laughs> at, at the moment. Um, any other questions? Mr. Abbott, anything from you? No, sir. Uh, Alvin, we're done. Just, just an overall okay. comment, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to take a moment to thank um, all the utilities that are here for meeting with the Impro Enterprise Committee every month. Um, I know it may be a little bit time consuming and nobody wants to meet um, unnecessarily. I certainly don't. But um, for starters, our utilities are um, major investments within our community and economic drivers also. And it's important for the assembly to stay on top of, um, of what's happening. Um, and just in case, for those who don't know, this is a, a committee and not all assembly members are on this committee. But during our assembly meeting, committee reports are given so that, you know, briefly so that all assembly me members know what's going on with our um, investments in our community. So I just wanted to share that and, and also, again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you guys for coming, all, all of you. Um, a lot of food for thought. Um, it, it's a good meeting. Uh, you probably need to have more of them. <laughs> But uh, as Elby said, these are major projects, major investments. Uh, all of them have some risks. The Asplen facility certainly has risks, uh, as does the new construction in any way, shape, or form. So uh, everybody's got big projects going, and uh, uh, we're just praying to the gods that everything comes out right. But uh, you guys are doing good. Thank you. And adjourn.